kind of in two different worlds. Both have to do with fonts, but that is where the similarity ends. Most of my time, and at least half of my income, comes from designing fonts. My first commercial typeface was Hypatia Sands, designed during my decade doing font work at Adobe, with help from Robert Slimbach, Miguel Sousa, and Paul Hunt. Christophero is a Victorian revival funded on Kickstarter, and Science Gothic, seen here, is an expansion of Bank Gothic with a huge style range commissioned by Google, which I created with Vassal Kateliev and Brandon Burkle. I also taught many type design workshops with the Crafting Type Collective. But, as improbable as it might sound, besides being a type designer, that is somebody who makes fonts, I make as much as half my income from being a forensic specialist dealing with fonts, that is, a font detective. And today I want to tell you about one of my more recent cases involving a significant mistake on my part and a famous thing I can't even discuss. Well, not entirely. I can tell you a little about it. I'm calling this one the secret of the certificate, although I also like the sound of the Barabe black letter. It was Friday, November 1st, 2019. I just a few months earlier transitioned to doing a mix of type design and forensic work as my pair of full-time things. I was just wrapping up primary design work on science coffee. Early that morning, I popped an email from Joe Barabe. I met Joe a year before at a small document forensics conference in Savannah, Georgia. Joe is a forensic specialist who deals specifically with microscopic analysis. And he wanted to know if I might be interested in being one of a couple of specialists helping him on a case about a certificate that needed to be validated or debunked. And of course, I was interested. Now, my tale just focuses on my part of this investigation. Uh, other folks were looking at paper and other aspects. Before long, I was looking at a picture of this document. It was a complicated backstory. So here's my problem. What can I tell about the creation and potential authenticity or lack of this frame certificate, if anything, from the font and typography? Now, the version I was initially looking at had just, just a few extra words compared to what you're looking at. Um, the names of the three daughters who gave the present at the bottom. But my version was still, at least at first, missing the second word after der, which was pretty critical. Given what was being censored, I was immediately curious. What the heck did these three daughters give their dad that's so important that it has to be initially secret even from one of the people investigating it? And why does it get a definite article? Der is like the in English. And so an indefinite article, I or an. So that extra word I had that you did, did not was intriguing, but didn't quite give it away. So why was it the something instead of a something? So my first step, what is the font? It's an example of the Schwabacher style black letter. I think anybody can see there are plenty of distinctive letters to look at here. A few that stick out for me, capital S, H, Z, and especially the D. I love that D. You can see it right in the middle there. Funny thing though, one of the most important classification points comes from one of the least ornate letters. Why do I call it Schwabacher? Because of the lowercase o. It might seem kind of innocuous, but this particular style of o, rounded on both sides, but with pointy ends, drawn in two strokes with a broadening pen, is sort of a particular earmark for this Schwabacher category. Why does that matter? We'll narrow things down. In the simple black letter classification system, such as this one from the German DIN standard, it has four kinds of black letter, and Schwabacher is one of them. But you can go further. This black letter classification expands on the DIN standard, so that center column there, instead of just a Schwabacher, actually has four different things, uh, Schwabacher being the most common, but separating out a couple of others. Schwabacher is now one of 13 categories. Meanwhile, I was asking Joe a lot of questions. What's the purported date of the certificate? 1979 or 1980. So if the document was authentic, the font would have had to have been available around then. Not that we assume authenticity, of course. And what was this document about? So I assume got a version of the document without the middle redaction. So there's no longer concealing the name of the president. So I saw what it was. Now, I can't share that, but I can say, yes, like me, you might very well recognize this thing I had already seen it before this on display in a museum. And from the last time I was sold at auction, I can say it's worth 
millions of dollars, quite a few millions. In fact, at one time, it was ranked the most valuable eh, thing of its category in the world. So I started looking for the font. I looked through catalogs. I was coming up blank. Finally, I just started looking at every font tag, black letter, and my fonts. It was over 800 fonts. My font says, you know, a couple hundred thousand fonts. Good chance I'd find it, right? And being knowledgeable, able to choose some particularly distinctive letters to compare about cross fonts, I was able to go through all 840 or whatever it was, uh, black letter fonts on my fonts. Zoom, zoom, zoom. No match. By no match, I don't mean there was that nothing was a precise match. I mean, there was no version of this font at all. Now, I later realized that going through all the black letter fonts on my fonts like this would not actually give me every single such font on my fonts. Just most of them, including all the at all popular ones. But here's the catch. My fonts relies on its users, like me and you, to tag fonts. When fonts get loaded into my fonts, they're not immediately tagged with keywords. That's something that users add. So if there are not enough users looking at or caring about a particular font on my fonts, you might be missing some tags that really ought to have. This also explains why there are fonts tagged black letter that probably shouldn't be, but that problem is not, a, is not bothering me here. So this is only true for especially obscure fonts. <clears throat> So either this font was very little used, or no version of it was available on my fonts. So what did I do? I took a handful of representative letters, just half a dozen, well, seven, and a little commentary, and sent it to a couple of FontKey colleagues who I knew the knowledgeable in this exact area, and waited to see what they might say. Ben Reynolds is a type designer and font expert who used to work at Line & Type. Dan is especially keen on black letter typefaces. That elaborate classification system I showed earlier, Dan created this system and wrote about it as part of a lengthy article on black letter typefaces. So in other words, if anybody knows black letter, it's Dan. Florian Hardwick is a more general master of font idea in history. And he had previously helped me with what I consider my trickiest ever font idea in another case over a decade earlier, where the client was a city in California. Dan got back to me first, but actually turned out Florian had previously written about this exact typeface. So yeah, either one of them could have ID'd it, no problem. So here it is, which they both pointed out, Tudor Black, originally designed by Prince and Tarrant for the Miller Richard Foundry of Edinburgh in 1878. 1878, so 100 years earlier than my document. Um, it was imitated and recut by many competitors and other later foundries, including ATF, from his catalogs, I have it in my catalog collection, up to 1923. So why did I totally fail in my first attempt at font ID? I have multiple catalogs with this typeface in it. Was I a complete idiot? Arguably, yes. But essentially, I just hadn't gone back nearly far enough. Knowing the document was from 1979 or later, I was looking at dry transfer lettering, phototype, modern digital fonts, <clears throat> etc. But all my catalogs with versions of Tudor Black in them were at least 50 years older than this, dating to 1923 or earlier. Yes, once I knew it was Tudor Black, I was able to find that it was also done in later font technologies, but only the really old versions were terribly common at the time. The newer ones are super obscure. So there was a les lesson learned for me. Do not restrict myself based on time assumptions, not even with seemingly generous leeway. Okay, so that said, all these metal versions originated in the late 1800s or very early 1900s, and none of them was a great match. They all had subtle but real differences. Now that I had the right name, I could find digital versions of them, and none of them matched the document either. They were all significantly different. So what exactly was this thing? Of course, I looked at the document more. There were some oddities that had bothered me from the beginning. Look at this capital R, for instance. The leg has had pieces broken off, but those pieces are still present, just shifted. What the heck is that about? Something similar has happened near the top of this O. 
look at how they're, and it's a very irregular piece broken off. Like it's something broke very crisply, not the kind of thing you see with ink. And these are just two, but there are many, many other cases of this throughout the certificate. I started theorizing about what had happened. So the certificate was framed. Could it be that bits of the letters were sticking to the glass? Not they still stuck to the glass? Joe Barabe had scanned this himself. Did he have the original? Could he answer this question? He did have it, and he could. And there were indeed bits of these letters that he detached from the paper and stuck to the glass. Or in some cases, they were on the paper, just in a different position. I suspect that in these latter cases, they had been stuck to the glass in between. So sticking to the glass first breaks the letter, and then it restitches the paper afterwards. Now that also implies a paper and glass interaction over time, maybe with storage, where something you know has been shifted about. Sometimes it gets gotten pressed against the glass, and other times not. So. Um, that is consistent with it being an older document. So this, of course, brought up the question of how these letters were reproduced. Most printing processes are not subject to this kind of degradation, or could do this. Under some uncommon circumstances, toner-based printing, such as laser printing, can stick to something else. And I've seen this happen, mostly with like clear plastic covers on reports, but not with glass or anything else. Not to mention that I had already eliminated all the digital versions of the font I found due to design differences. So the only way that you could have gotten this in toner would be to have an original created some other way and then photocopy, or at least from the versions I had. So an obvious possibility springs to mind. Dry transfer letter, like Letraset, not only was appropriate to the supposed period, but it completely explains the kind of broken letters we were seeing. They could have been perfect at first, but if at some point the paper got pressed more against the glass, in storage, whatever, that could lead to this problem. You know, letter set and dry transfer lettering it is a little fragile, and it can crack and break in this same kind of way. So this idea fit perfectly. Now I just had to find a dry transfer version of that typeface, Tudor Gothic. I had just one letter set print catalog. I got one with a better date, I got a competitor's catalog, and I found several other dry transfer catalogs online. By the end of my initial dry transfer exploration, I'd eliminated five major vendors of dry transfer lettering, all the biggest ones in North America at least. None of them had this typeface. Heck, there were only a couple of black letter fonts in the whole set. Black letter just wasn't a popular thing any time in the brief heyday of dry transfer lettering in the 70s and 80s. Worse, <clears throat> I was running out of time. I had a typeface to design. Joe was waiting for my report, and this was all taking much longer than I expected, and I couldn't help feeling like I must be missing something else obvious. So I posted an open question about black letter typefaces in dry transfer lettering. No pictures or samples, no hints, just trying to learn what else might possibly be out there, other dry transfer vendors I wasn't thinking of. There were a few other less helpful responses, nothing too exciting. And out of the blue came a post from the fellow in the middle in this picture, uh, Claudio Piccinini. Claudio, without having been given any visual clues, not even the name of the font, nor the style of black letter, he seemingly randomly gives me a perfect match. It isn't from a German-speaking country, but it is from Italy, so it's close. It's dry transfer lettering from a company I've never even heard of. They were not among the top five global or U.S. makers of dry transfer lettering. I don't think they were even among the top ten. And it doesn't even have the same name. It has a semi-generic name of Gothic RN. So soon I'm buying some of this vintage dry transfer lettering on eBay. And uh, I'm looking at an online copy of their catalog, also pointer to, from Claudio. Soon I'm looking at these. I inspect them, they're a beautiful match. Lettering comes in exactly three sizes, the largest of which would be a perfect match on size as well. So I have the answer. Yes, I do painstaking comparisons and make a fancy chart. So this is a part of that chart from page 12 of my 30-page report, where I show how the dry transfer version of the font matches far better than any modern digital version. 
yes, it's a smaller size and my scanning it through the plastic made it come out a little bolder than it should have. But the larger version, when transferred paper, seems like it would have been a perfect match. So I demonstrate for Joe, my client, and their lawyers what I've learned. So we know what the font is, we know the source of the font, at least so it seems, and what the technology was for the document. None of the digital versions match worth the darn, nor did the original metal types, but this one brand make a dry transfer dead on and the exact right size. If you go to Fonts in Use, a great site today, it reflects all the extra research I've mentioned here. A lot of my case presentations tend to make me look oh so very clever. This is not one of those. Admittedly, okay, I recognize signs of dry transfer lettering, and I convinced Joe that that was a likely thing. But uh, beyond that, I only take credit for knowing who else to ask and learning from my dumb mistakes. Now, to be clear, while my methods can prove something is not authentic, I never really prove that something is authentic not through idea of fonts and printing technologies. But in a case like this, I certainly can say that the document is completely consistent with how such a document would have been created at that purported date. And further, I can point out that it would have taken a truly masterful forger with amazing skills to locate and use antique dry transfer lettering, and then further make it seem like the document had been around for such a long time with peculiar degradation, consistent with age and storage and such. Theoretically, yeah, all this could be done by a forger. It would have been a remarkably skillful job of it. Possible? Sure, in theory, unlikely. And I gather all of Joe's other lines of inquiry also supported the idea that the document was consistent with something authentically created 40 years ago. So it is it's my understanding that you know, Joe reported back that it appeared to be authentic. So what was the final outcome of the case? Well, all I can say is that while a court date had been proposed, it ultimately settled out of court. I believe that Joe Barabe's report, which incorporated mine, played a significant part in that. But thanks for coming. That's how we resolve the secret of the certificate. And if you're watching this live, I'm happy to take some questions and there's some contact info if you need it. There we go. So, I am happy to take questions if you have any. I'm assuming this is broadcasting as it seems to be. And you're welcome. I hope that was fun. This is definitely an atypical case, but then all the really interesting ones are atypical, right? Uh, and uh, yes, there are a lot of confidentiality requirements. Um, for some cases, if I know you personally and I could get you to sign an NDA, I could tell you for this one, uh, no. <clears throat> um, if a forger used brittle old dry transfer lettering, might the pattern of breakage have been the same? Well, just being brittle wasn't the odd thing, you know? And it like, it bits broke off and then restuck. And I don't know, um, I actually have some of that some vintage dry transfer lettering of this type, I could do an experiment. That's an interesting point, John. John Barry asked that. I, even though the case is over, my curiosity isn't, I will have to go test that. Um, I really should have the, the actual real dry transfer lettering right here, which I don't have it out, foolish me. Um, other questions? When is the Font Detective TV show going to air? Netflix or Prime? Funny you should ask that. I have twice had someone talk about a TV show. Now, one person didn't know what the heck, you know, they weren't a TV person. But the other guy who brought up the idea um, has is, in fact, an actual TV showrunner, has had shows on actual networks, <coughs> um, at least a couple. And... Uh, I'm not saying he's like the most successful guy in history, but um, he was interested in like trying to do some sort of web series about it, but he was going to make it a comedy. So, um, and, you know, not starring me, obviously. <clears throat> Who would play me on the show? Damn good question. <clears throat> I don't know. I was thinking maybe a Steven Seagal type. Seems about right, you know. 
maybe, you know, he's a little older than I am, but otherwise, you know, good physical match. Any other questions, comments? Things you need to know. Um, well, I'll give it another 10 or 20 seconds, but if nobody else comes up with something, we'll call it a day. It was fun. And um, I do have a site out there, thefontdetective.com. And uh, oh, I missed a question from Petra. Boop, 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 boop. Sorry, Petra. Oh, can I explain for younger participants what dry transfer lettering is? Um, I can, and I am like wanting to pull some out. Oh, well. Um, so dry transfer lettering basically is um, a clear plastic sheet with this black stuff on it. It's not terribly sticky. Also known as rub down lettering, as John says, because that's what you do. You take the plastic sheet and put it against your paper and you run something hard against it, a burnishing device, and that presses the lettering that's on the other side of the sheet against the paper. And when it is under enough pressure, it transfers from the plastic to the paper. So, um, <clears throat> so it transfers, but it's a it's dry lettering. It's not like it's some sort of sticker in the normal sense. Um, you, do, you don't want to leave it. It has sort of a protective layer against it as well normally for storage. Um, and you don't want to put a whole lot of pressure on it because as you can see, you know, it could stick against something. So uh, yeah, so that was dry transfer lettering. It was an interesting, brief, short-lived technology. It's still around. You can buy it, but it's just not very heavily used and there isn't as much of it around, not as many vendors and so on, because we've got computers now and that's an easy way to produce lettering. Um, but in the 70s and 80s, after it was invented, but before we had computers, um, it was a big thing for a while. Um, Oh, another question. Can I comment on the Killian documents controversy? I have a whole talk about that, but the short version is that the the movie is kind of uh, bullshit. Uh, and uh, um, the, the Bush National Guard memos were pretty blatant forgeries. And the reason you can tell is because they didn't have that degree of fineness of proportional spacing just didn't exist outside of full-on typesetting at the time. Even proportional typewriters, although they did exist, could not do that degree of fineness of proportion, not something that would exactly match Times Roman. Uh, um, do they use dry transfer lettering on museum walls? Um, probably not, or only at the smaller sizes. Um, I would think that on, for museum walls, they primarily use um, some sort of stencil-like approach because um, the dry transfer stuff was never made really big. It would have been uh, really, it's somewhat painstaking per letter to do it. So most of it is like, you know, up to 36, 48, maybe 72 point, but not much beyond that typically. Um, Ah, they use vinyl in museums. There you go. Cut vinyl. Or they called Michael Harvey to do it. Oh, man. If, you've, if anyone has not seen Michael Harvey's stone cut inscriptions at the National Gallery in London, holy smokes. It's like uh, one of those, seeing that for the first time in person like was like one of those transcendental lettering moments for me. Yeah, I miss him too. He was an awesome guy. Well, I think that is about it, unless there's a, any more questions. I'll give you another couple of seconds. Uh, 
for those who, I mean, that wasn't entirely clear. Michael Harvey, besides doing some typefaces, was primarily a stone carving lettering artist, did stone carving for a number of monuments and such. He had himself trained under Gill, I think, if I recall correctly, or maybe someone who trained under Gill. I might be right. And uh, I briefly studied a little stone carving under Michael, just in a couple of workshops, and it was immensely valuable. And yes, folks can move to the Hangout Room if they want to keep chatting, and I will join you all there. Um, thanks, all. <laughs>